All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Lou Kerner, and thanks for joining us for Stables Are Killing It, <laughs> show number 17. Uh, uh, it's a good time at Stablecoin. We recently passed $20 billion in market cap, and I think everyone on this call would probably agree that that's just the beginning. We've got a great show today. Um, we've got, uh, it's going to focus on stable coins from emerging markets. Uh, and we've got two uh, experts on that topic with us today. Uh, the first is Diego Cesar uh, with BRZ, a Brazilian uh, uh, stable coin. Uh, Tiago, welcome. Thank you very much, Lou. Well, nice to see you guys. Thank you, Sinan, as well. Uh, and our uh, other featured guest today is a Sinan coach. Uh, with Bailera. Sinan? Hello, it's great to be here. Uh, so uh, I guess, Sinan, you said uh, uh, you're joining us from uh, um, uh, Istanbul? Yes, we're in Istanbul, Turkey currently, and we're building a Turkish lira back stable coin. Okay, terrific. And, uh, and Tiago, you said you're, uh, you're in Estonia, correct? Yeah, at the moment I'm in Estonia, but our main headquarters is in Switzerland. However, our largest office is in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. Oh, wow. Okay, cool. So uh, uh, as always, the show is quite global. Um, so uh, we're going to have the standard format. Uh, we're going to start with Sinan, uh, and he's going to give us a, a presentation uh, about Bailera. And then uh, we'll have Tiago, who will give us a presentation about BRZ. And then we'll have the second half of the show for Q&A with the audience. So if you have a question, put it into the chat. And with that, uh, I am going to make uh, Sinan is going to start the show uh, and I'm going to make him now the uh, host so he can grab the screen. And now you're uh, the host. Okay. Uh, sounds great. So, hello everyone. Uh, we're building a Turkish lira backed stablecoin. And as uh, in the crypto space, there has been a lot of different stablecoins following Tether, the USD stablecoin. And us and Tiago have been uh, representing the emerging country currencies for that. And what we do is a fiat backed stablecoin where we have partnerships and bank accounts where the users pass through KYC and send us the fiat tokens. And in exchange, we send the same. Uh, amount of tokens to their ERC20 vault addresses. And currently we are on the Ethereum mainnet and we have also built a version on Avalanche and launching uh, on the Avalanche mainnet next week. And stable coins are a big part of this new uh, financial infrastructure. And we believe that the current financial uh, markets are a traditional messaging system and blockchain is giving a decentralized alternative for this. And we're very excited to see uh, what to come and onboard the people from the emerging countries uh, to this ecosystem. Hey, Sinan, a couple of quick questions. Uh, first, can you talk about the KYC process? Yes. Uh, so we pass everyone through KYC. So we're connected to the government through APIs. And at the initial entrance, we ask for uh, their name, uh, date of birth, and Turkish ID number and verify that. And with that, they can uh, access to a certain amount of bidder tokens. And after that, we ask for a ID photocopy and a selfie with today's date and with their ID. And with that, we can verify that the person who's entering is the person who supports the ID. And we also pass them through AML. Uh, and we do not accept cash uh, currently. And we have to match the bank name with the KYC name uh, to make sure that uh, it's coming from that person. And about how many people have passed through KYC to date? So we have around 2,500 people who pass through uh, KYC on our platform. And about what percentage of the people who try to pass the KYC end up passing? So our level one uh, ID is very simple. So around 95% of the people have passed through that. And out of the people who did the KYC one, around 40% of them did the KYC two. Okay, and is there any is there any kind of one thing that's causing uh, the sixty percent not to clear generally? It's not about not clearing, but it, it takes a process to take the selfie, to write the thing, and get the ID of your photo. So usually, people who want to trade uh, on the crypto exchanges pass through this uh, second KYC. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And and real quick, I'll let you get back to your presentation, but I thought it was so interesting when you mentioned that you're going to go live on Avalanche. 
Yes. So uh, Ethereum has been uh, great and has a great network effect. And the DeFi use cases are a great trial to test on. But Ethereum gas costs and the speed of the network has been uh, lagging a bit. Uh, and we are looking into new use cases. And that's why we're looking into new layer one protocols. And we have been very impressed of Avalanche uh, technology. So we decided to take a leap of faith there and to build on them. And they just launched their mainnet uh, last week. And we're very excited to move from the testnet to the mainnet. And we're also speaking with different layer one protocols. And what matters for us is where the users are going and where the use cases are going. So we're going to be blockchain agnostic. And if EVE 2.0 becomes successful and Ethereum is going to be the main layer, we'll continue on that. But if another layer goes for specific uh, use cases and is more efficient in that way, we'll build on them as well. And so there is no, is there any business relationship between you and Avalanche? So the Avalanche founder is a famous Turkish corner professor, Emin Gün Sirak, <laughs> and we have he's, been- he's, uh, he's a pretty controversial character. Uh, he is, but we have been working uh, in detail since my early days in crypto, and we have been following their project in detail, uh, and we're going to see uh, what's going to happen with it. Yeah, no, certainly. I mean, I know some of the smartest people in, in crypto are super excited about the Avalanche. So uh, thanks for answering the questions. Can you continue? Yeah, of course. So as Bilira, we have three uh, different products. So we have a native token called the TRYB uh, on the Ethereum blockchain, which is a stable coin pegged to the Turkish Lira. And the price is always equal to uh, the Turkish Lira and you can issue it through us and redeem it through us as well. And it's also live on both local exchanges on the, for the Bilira Turkish Lira pair. And it's also live on global exchanges like FTX, Bitrex, and DEXs like Uniswap, Kyber, and Balancer. And what we do is it allows Turkish users to access the crypto markets and different exchanges with only a domestic bank transfer. So we become the representation of the Turkish lira on the blockchain. Uh, and why this is needed is that smart contracts cannot read uh, the money in your bank account. And that's why we act as a gateway uh, to test these new pilot programs. And on the other end, we also have a platform where the users can come, go through KYC AML, uh, request and currently we're only non-custodial so the user has to have an ERC20 address or they need to have a, a account in one of the exchanges that support us also on our dashboard they can connect their uh, Coinbase wallet, Argent wallet, Metamask uh, and different uh, options like Portis and such where they can see their balances on our dashboard and also on our dashboard we have uh, users can send the Bilira tokens and can see the prices uh, of the Turkish Lira and the Bilira pairs. And we're also uh, next week launching a DeFi site where users can ac access the DeFi use cases directly from our dashboard. And as a third part, we have an off, which allows us to do Bilira login and for users to pass by KYC on different uh, websites. And for this, we started with a donation use case. So normally for donation around 20, 30% of uh, the donations go to overhead costs in Turkey. And we created a platform where the donor and the students come together and every student has a smart contract address where uh, we're giving them a thousand Bilira tokens for 12 months. And the 12,000 Bilira tokens uh, are sent by the donors to this a smart contract and every month a thousand billion tokens is sent to uh, the student's ERC20 address and with this uh, we give 100% of the donations uh, to the student and it can be seen transparently. Uh, so these are our product suits and on our dashboard so this is how our dashboard looks you can connect your wallet issue or redeem Bira tokens and swap and send tokens to uh, different people. 
And transparency is very important for uh, centralized stablecoin companies like us. So we are going through audits uh, every quarter to show uh, the fiat backed in our bank accounts with the ERC20 uh, tokens uh, in circulation uh, to make sure that they're uh, the same. And also as for Turkey, uh, the regulation uh, has been positive. Uh, so we have been speaking with the central bank a lot and the central bank uh, also has a plan to research the CBDCs, the central bank digital currencies. And they understand that this new messaging system has a chance for the financial system to be uh, re-evaluated. And they are seeing us as a pilot project and they asked us to do all these KYCs and AMLs and following how the users uh, are going through this. And also uh, we have a multi-sig uh, structure where uh, the founders cannot issue bidder tokens by themselves, but needs uh, multiple uh, confirmations. And as for the bidder use cases, uh, we work as a fiat on-ramp and off-ramp uh, to the crypto exchanges. So in local uh, exchanges, the Turkish lira pairs are usually has less liquidity and could uh, go with a price swing, but both us and Tiago have been working with FTX closely and uh, it allows uh, emerging country users to only send a domestic bank transfer and then see their tokens in these global exchanges. Then we have a pair with Tether uh, where uh, both the market makers and us add liquidity to, and then they can go to Tether without slippage and then they can enjoy the other uh, activity, other uh, trading uh, pairs and coins with the exchange's current uh, liquidity. So currently we're the cheapest uh, way for buying Tether and Bitcoin from Turkey with Turkish Lira. So I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I didn't follow what you said that you would allow them to buy it without any slippage. What's, and, and you're doing that yourself or using Uniswap or? So there are uh, external market makers and we also uh, market make ourselves. And our goal is to try to bring the Bilira Tether pair closest to the real Turkish Lira dollar uh, price. And with that, they can, the Turkish users can have their Turkish Lira uh, Bilira tokens change to Tether and then enjoy the exchange's existing liquidity. And, and global oh, sorry. market maker, are, are you talking about an OTC desk or an, an automated market maker? Uh, so no, it's on centralized exchanges, it's normal market maker, which puts bid and ask prices for the Bilira Tether pair. But we're also on Uniswap and there's an uh, AMM uh, on that, uh, which we're seeing two different uh, positions on that. Okay, thanks. And as for uh, the DeFi instruments, uh, we have been a big believer in DeFi. Uh, and with that, uh, currently we're on some DEXs, uh, Uniswap, Kyber, and Balancer. And actually today we start a campaign on Balancer to allow other people to add tokens and get a ball uh, reward from that as well. And this is very interesting because every user can add uh, liquidity worth 100 uh, Turkish Liras or any amount they want and can start getting part of the trading fees. And also users have their own uh, custodies for doing these transactions. And also for DeFi, lending borrowing use case has been very interesting for us. And we're speaking with both decentralized and centralized uh, lending protocols uh, because the overnight interest rate in Turkey is around eight, nine percent. But if you want to get a loan uh, out, it's going to be 15 to 20 percent, depending on the company's credit score. And with that uh, being said, on these platforms with the borrower putting some collateral on, uh, they could meet up at 11 or 12 percent. So it would be both better for the user who's getting the overnight interest and better for the borrower who's looking for capital. Uh, and in this situation, it has to be over collateralized. But we believe in the upcoming years with a reputational layer, uh, there's going to be uh, under collateralized loan, uh, loan starting as well. And as for uh, international remittance, so more usually between uh, traditional fiat FXs, 
you have to move to USD to be able to do the transfer. But with the stable coins and being both on DEXs and centralized exchanges, we're excited that we can open up direct pairs. And for instance, in the future, Bilira and BRZ could have a direct pair and the people who are doing business in between could enjoy uh, changing their tokens uh, directly through that as well. And we also had a, a user from the US who wanted to send a flower to her mom in Turkey, uh, to his mom in Turkey. And with that, normally Swift cost around $50 for a thousand dollar transaction from Turkey or to Turkey from the US. And with uh, using DeFi tools, uh, he managed to send uh, Bira tokens uh, and get it to his bank uh, with much less uh, costs. And we also have uh, some ecosystem partners where we have uh, traditional finance and banking partnerships. We have four different banking partnerships and a couple e-money uh, licensed companies. We have uh, wallet providers uh, like ERC20 wallets and uh, different uh, wallets. And we're on exchanges like FTX, Bittrex, uh, and the DEXs. And we're also big believers of the decentralized finance side and things have been uh, growing and uh, allowing easy access to our uh, Turkish users by only doing a domestic bank transfer and reaching uh, the global crypto ecosystem, which is borderless. Thank you. This is... Uh, what I mainly want to explain about the emerging country stablecoin. Okay, that was great. Thanks for sticking around uh, for the Q&A section of it. Uh, and now I'm going to make Tiago. Uh, you are now, hold on a second. Uh, uh. Sorry, one moment. You are now the host and can grab the screen. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Lou. Let me share the screen. Mm, can you guys see it? Yep. Awesome. Perfect. Okay. So uh, I have a brief presentation much in the same way as Sinan did, uh, did. and uh, let me put it full screen here. Yeah, you still see it, right? Yep. Awesome. Well, so basically um, regarding our company, so basically Transfero is the name of our group, right? It's based in Switzerland. And the project, the BRZ project, I mean the stable coin, the Brazilian stable coin was launched in 2019. Uh, however, our company is working with crypto specifically in Brazil since 2015, as you can see here. We were a fiat payment, ga payment gateway and also a credit card acquirer in Brazil in 2015. We used to process transactions for, for merchants, online merchant, merchants, and we quickly integrated Bitcoin into our solution. Uh, as you may imagine, back in 2015 and then 16 and 17, no one actually used Bitcoin for payments. Uh, it turned into like a much more of an investment asset. And in the specific case of Brazil, uh, I have to give a bit of context why we created the stable coin and it has direct relationship with that past that we had as a, as a fiat gateway. So basically uh, from 2016 onwards, uh, Brazilian import and export companies, they started to figure that using Bitcoin to perform international payments was way easier and cheaper than using banks to perform international payments. Uh, the reason for that, the number one is Brazil has capital controls, which means that it's very diff difficult for a company, medium-sized or small-sized company, to actually perform a dollar transfer out of the country. Uh, and second, the banks are not willing to work with the medium-sized and small-sized companies in Brazil. Uh, just a, as a reference, the only currency that can be held in a bank, a Brazilian bank account is the Brazilian real, which means there are no USD accounts or euro accounts uh, in a Brazilian bank. And on the flip side, 
uh, the Brazilian real itself, the, the fiat currency, is a non-deliverable forward, which means that you cannot trade Brazilian reais in foreign banks. You cannot actually deliver, you cannot settle internationally with Brazilian reais. That makes Brazil a very unique country because it is one of the world's largest economy, but it's completely not integrated to the international financial community. Uh, with that said, uh, we, in 2016, we realized that people were actually purchasing Bitcoin in order to perform international payments. Well, as you can, can imagine, in 2017, 18, and then 19, the Bitcoin price in Brazilian reais was getting out of control, a little bit like you had in Korea. A lot of demand for people willing to buy Bitcoin with local currency in Brazil and not a lot of uh, supply of people actually willing to sell Bitcoin for the local Brazilian currency. So there were times where the Bitcoin in Brazil was trading at a premium of 15 to 20%. Uh, that's why I did this parallel with Korea because the same happened in Korea. They used to call the, the kimchi spread in Korea and in Brazil, it was just the spread. Uh, and quickly, people who actually had any way to do the arbitrage would tackle that and, and, and profit from it. But as I mentioned, the capital controls made it, well, it was not so efficient to actually arbitrage on that. And now let's go back to our history as a fiat gateway. So since we were a payment processing company before getting into the crypto space, that means that in Brazil, we, have, we are one of the few companies with capabilities of sending US dollars out of, out of Brazil. Uh, for a very competitive rate and in any amount necessary. With that said, we, in 2019, we said, okay, if Bitcoin is not solving the issue anymore, I mean, it's getting too expensive. And then also the blockchain was quite clogged and uh, people were waiting like one hour, two hours, five hours to get a confirmation on their, on their transaction. Uh, we basically said, okay, let's create a stable coin that will solve the same problem. It will give price stability and more predictability to those import and export companies to perform their international payments. And that's what we did. So in 2019, we actually launched the BRZ. And the, pro the proposition of the BRZ is to actually be an international payment system. Uh, it's of course, an asset that is being traded uh, on FTX, on Bittrex, I'll show the list of exchange later, exchanges later, but it's not really the retail market that is using BRZ. Um, right now it's increasing the usage for the retail market, but most of our customers are B2B, our, our companies, import and export companies. And those guys, uh, they are now trusting that the BRZ is a one-to-one -one paired with the Brazilian Real. We keep our reserves in cash, crypto, and also in foreign currency. So we are over collateralized. Uh, our main idea is that we have to have at least 100% of the reserves in, in Brazilian money, right? In Brazilian reais, in cash, because BRZ is a, a high velocity asset, I would say. What does that mean? It means that every time someone buys BRZ, five or 10 minutes later, that same person is exchanging BRZ for dollars, euros, or any other uh, hard assets outside of Brazil, which means that we are constantly having minting and redemption, minting and redemption. And we don't actually hold on to that much collateral because of that dynamic of the BRZ. Um, so yeah, as you can see here in the presentation, uh, one BRZ is one Brazilian real. Uh, it is by far the largest uh, stablecoin project in Brazil. There are at least two more. Uh, and our key advantages, as I mentioned before, are, of course, the stability. Um, people don't have to rely anymore on a volatile Bitcoin or Ethereum to perform an international transfer. They are doing it on a stablecoin. Uh, we hold the reserves. Uh, this October, it will be our first proof of funds, and we are going to do it monthly with external audit parties, uh, which includes uh, law firms and accounting firms, uh, not only from Brazil, but also from Switzerland. Uh, it's an ERC-20 token. I mean, when we made that decision back in the day, it was just a matter of uh, how easy it was to integrate into exchanges um, and uh, the global acceptance. Today, uh, a BRZ is actually, if you go to FTX and you trade BRZs for dollars, you are getting that independently of us, what I mean by that is market makers will give you dollars for BRZ and then they will come to us and settle that BRZ uh, for dollars directly with us, with, with ourselves. Um, 
so I mentioned that the BRZ, it's more of a payment mechanism, an international payment mechanism, right? So together with the BRZ, most of our clients, they are actually using our gateway solution. And how does that work? So for example, let's say you have uh, uh, one of our like largest client base are like online gaming platforms. Uh, so they don't have a company in Brazil. They don't have a bank account in Brazil. They don't wanna have both in Brazil. So what do they do? They plug into our Fiat gateway. We provide them a local Brazilian sub account, an actual bank account, a Fiat bank account where can, they can receive uh, bank transfers and send out bank transfers to any bank in Brazil. And as soon as a customer performs a deposit, let's say 1000 reais deposit into that bank account, uh, our API informs the platform about that 1000 real deposit. The platform of our, of our, well, our partner's platform will then credit the user 1000 BRZs. We are going to do the transfer on the Ethereum blockchain. And later when the user uses that balance for any reason inside their platforms, they will come to us and redeem that amount for dollars. So this is the dashboard where all of our, um, especially online gaming or even some crypto exchanges that were willing to enter the Brazilian market, they see their transactions in such a dashboard. Every pay-ins they got, all the payouts they got and all the international settlements they did with us. Um, so basically our key advantage in that case is that you can enter the Brazilian market, which is such a difficult market without actually establishing a company and being liable to the Brazilian uncertainties that happen. And I would say Latin America in general, right? So to give you guys a brief example, when Binance entered the Brazilian market, they did it in a bit of a rushed way. They actually incorporated a company in Brazil, never managed to get a bank account. They did the wrong, wrong partnerships. And now they're getting a fine from the local Brazilian SEC, which is, well, not relevant in terms of money, but it is not good for the reputation. So by that, by saying that, what I mean is that with BRZ and with our solution, you can enter the Brazilian market without being liable to the uncertainties of the Brazilian market. Uh, so yeah, this is just a, a brief flow of how it works. So there is the bank account opening, if you wish. I mean, if you wanna integrate to our bank account uh, in Brazil, that will be fine. There will be the API that will tell you all about the deposits and withdrawals. It will be ready for pains and payouts. Uh, we do the payment processing and you can check everything on the dashboard. That's basically how it works. So it's, it's more of a, a complete payment solution for the Brazilian, uh, Brazilian market. And here is just the flow how the, what that I explained before of how the customer comes, deposits money into the account, the API confirms, and then the, the balance of BRZ appears on the partner's platform. Uh, just for reference, um, FTX uses exactly this mechanism on their, uh, we are their Brazilian fiat on ramp using the BRZ infrastructure. So that's the, the bulk of what, what, what I have to say. Uh, let me see if I missed something. Oh, um, I also agree with Sinan that most, uh, most probably within the next year or so, we are going to see direct corridors between uh, markets. What do I mean by that? I mean that if today a Brazilian wants to buy Turkish Liras, he has to go from Brazilian real to dollars and then to dollars from dollars to the British, uh, to the Turkish Lira. Uh, with stable coins, what we envision is that you have a, a direct corridor between currencies that right now don't have a pair in the international market. So you would be able to exchange BRZ for Bilira, you'll be able to exchange Brazilian reais for, for QCAD, the, the Canadian stable coin. So I think that's the next big thing in the, in the crypto space. And I think it's killer. And if there is a reason for crypto, for stable coins to exist, I think their use case are more prevalent in emerging countries, in developing countries, such as Turkey, Brazil, Argentina, Venezuela, all the countries where you actually have a pain in transferring money or, or internationalizing your assets or some other type of restriction that comes into play. Uh, these are the exchanges we are in now. So basically, this is not 100% up to date, but uh, we have Bitrex, uh, ZBX, FTX, Bitforex as our international ones. And we are in four Brazilian exchanges, which are over here in the, in the, in the bottom side, Novadax, BitRecife, BitPreço, and ProfitFi. And that's basically where most of the retail users, they come and buy BRZ. So they go buy BRZ over there. 
and then they sell their BRZ abroad for dollars or BTC or euros. Uh, our uh, B2B clients, the import and export companies, they come directly to our OTC desk. They usually don't use the books of exchanges to perform their, their purchases. Uh, this is the pricing and yeah, that's it. Okay, terrific. Um, those are both the presentations were, were great. Uh, now I'm gonna go to the uh, Q&A section uh, of the show and our first, hold on here, uh, our first question is from uh, Ganesh. Ganesh? Okay. Oh, uh, sorry, one second. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so thank you for um, the presentations. I found it very interesting. Um, so my, I'm a researcher at Warwick Business School and I'm researching stable coins. And so I wanted to ask a couple of things. So um, Sinan, you talked a bit about uh, the infrastructure and I wanted to find out a little bit more about how the multi-sig uh, process worked. And I guess questions to both um, Sinan and Tiago are, um, to what extent will stable coins be held in bank accounts? Like will most of it be held in bank accounts? And if so, will there be an interest rate uh, on bank accounts similar to like interest rates on bank deposits in Lira and Real? Um, and more generally, um, is the use case for emerging markets that Emerging market currencies are generally more volatile, right? So if they're kind of a loss of credibility of, of the government, you know, you could get um, large swings in the exchange rate. And so having a crypto version of uh, the lira or real helps insulate investors and enables them to like move um, capital much easier in case there are like big shots to the ex exchange rate. Is that considered one of the use cases of, of having stable coins. Um, but yeah, those are my questions. Okay, terrific, Sidon, you wanna start? Uh, yeah. Of course, uh, thank you for the question. So how the process works on our side is that uh, the founders cannot issue Bira tokens by themselves. We need the verification of all three founders to issue Bira tokens. And then we move them to a kind of a hot wallet where then we send it transferred to the users who deposit fiat bank accounts. And once regulation comes in, we would be happy to also give one of the keys of the multisig address to the central bank as well, to, so that uh, as individuals, we won't be able to issue bira tokens unless the uh, fiat money comes uh, to the bank. And as for the banks, currently we only hold the fiat money there but we believe that in the future, the central banks will be able to hold stable coins on their balance sheets as well. And in the US, uh, some of the banks and the regulation is looking at holding USDC. Uh, so we're going to see as a global regulation comes, uh, what's going to happen on that end. Uh, and as for the last question, so we see blockchain as a new uh, type of messaging system. Like SWIFT is a messaging system as well. Different banking infrastructures are messaging systems where you trust the bank. And for the first time with uh, the decentralized blockchain, we have a messaging system that we don't have to trust a certain party, but we trust the miners and the process itself. So yes, uh, that both Turkish Lira and the Brazilian Real is losing value. But this is a process which makes it much easier to get the unbanked to into the banking sector because just by opening a Ethereum wallet, they can now start holding uh, the Bilira or BRZ tokens. And on the other end, with the current uh, payment infrastructure, if you buy a T-shirt for 100 Turkish Liras, the current payment providers charge between 25 to 3%. But with the blockchain technology, we can lower that to 0.3%. And the same, like to buy a Tesla stock from Turkey, it charges a minimum of $50. But from here, it could be only a gas cost and the commission on the DEX. So we're excited that 
the blockchain space and the central and uh, emerging country stable coins are democratizing uh, the world and giving access to the uh, people in these countries. Yeah, I would I would uh, agree with, of course, with Sinan. Uh, in the specific case of Brazil, um, I wouldn't say people are actually using the stablecoin as a, as a protection. Uh, I wouldn't say not yet, at least. I would say in, in Argentina, for example, yes, for sure, uh, but not in Brazil yet. Uh, however, uh, for sure, Brazilians are using the stablecoin as a, as a capital mobility tool, like uh, uh, since they are very restricted to, to, to transfer money abroad and to even simple cases, for example, in Brazil, if you have a son studying in the United States, it's very difficult to send more than $3,000 per month to that person. Uh, there are several cases in Brazil of people will, that had to pay, for example, medical treatment in the United States and they were unable to send the money. So the stable coin actually solves that problem. Uh, and I think uh, that that's the main use case now in for for retail uh, individuals in Brazil, I would say, um, not not as an inflation protection, but more as a capital mobility. If something goes wrong, they can quickly exchange that to dollars and and be protected in a sense. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Ganesh. Um, our next question is going to come from uh, Denny. Gotta unmute your mic. Hello, greetings from Istanbul, Turkey. Um, greetings to Sinan, uh, to you and Tiago. Uh, hello. Um, I have a question. Uh, firstly, forgive me for I haven't read your white paper yet. I'm really sorry, but I am following the project. Uh, I just heard about BRZ, but uh, I've been following uh, to Bilira for a very long time. Excuse me, the mask. It's a little bit foggy. Uh, my question is, <laughs> you're outside and, um, you know, police is watching, so we have to keep the masks on. Um, the question is, is Biller and BRZ um, planning to move on to its main lab? I'm asking this because uh, would it make any difference? Um, like, uh, it, would it be easier to comply with the local regulations? Because uh, here in Turkey today, uh, our uh, Minister, Ministry, of Econ uh, Ministry of Economy just announced that uh, there will be taxes on, there might be taxes on uh, cryptocurrencies. Uh, so what are your thoughts on this? I, I, I'm thinking that uh, both BRZ and Bilera are uh, ERC20 tokens. Uh, yes, so we are uh, currently on the mainnet. So you could go and pass uh, through KYC and get the token uh, on your Ethereum wallet address. But it's true that right now we operate in a gray area, uh, but we speak with the regulators a lot. And it's important for us that no users uh, gets harmed from this. That's why we do a deep KYC and AML uh, procedures. We also have a pausing and blacklisting functionality. So if something happens and the tokens used at the places where it shouldn't be used and, the reg and we tell the regulators, we can stop the tokens and give the fiat back to the government as well. And as for the announcement that happened uh, yesterday by the economy minister, uh, whatever rule comes in Turkey, and if you have to pay taxes on the gains from the cryptos, we're going to be doing that as well. But Bilira is a stable coin, so the value of it's always equal to the Turkish Lira. But by using us, if you buy Bitcoin, Tether, and gain uh, the currency and then come back, we're going to be complying with any type of rule and regulation that's uh, going to come. Great, thanks a lot. Okay, thanks for the question, Denny. Let's see, uh, we've got our next question here is from uh, Lori. And Lori, you are now a uh, panelist, so you can ask your question. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Um, my questions are for both Diego and Sinan. Uh, the first one is, what's the biggest bottleneck to faster growth and having more users? And the second question is, are either Turkey or Brazil considered CBDCs? Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Laurie. Uh, I'll, I'll go this time first, and then Sinan goes the next one. Weird. 
democratic. So um, the the biggest challenge for us to actually reach the, the retail market is um, right now we only accept bank transfers in Brazil. Um, and Brazil is a country that 40% uh, of the population is unbanked. So there is a, a large chunk of the, of the people <laughs> that we cannot reach because they deal with cash only and we cannot touch. I mean, by law, we, we, could, we cannot even refuse cash, but in practice, we do not accept cash. Uh, the AML problems and the KYC things are, they, they start getting too complicated in a, in a Latin American country when you deal with cash. Um, so yeah, I mean, getting the B2B market, it's growing steadily, by the way, just to give you a bit of numbers. Um, so basically in February this, this year, we had a circulating supply of 7 million Brazilian reais. That was around $1.5 million. Right now we have 45 million reais. So basically we grew like five times. Um, and our transaction volumes are in the order of $2 million a day. So it's quite, uh, it's growing quite impressively. And most of that volume is coming through the import and export companies. Uh, we are not actively advertising what we are doing because we're still a bit worried um, well, the if we get too big, then the regulator might start looking at us in another way. Uh, but we are letting it organically grow. So what's happening is one importer talks to another importer that talks to another importer. And when you see, you have all the guys who are doing auto parts imports in Brazil using BRZ for international payments. And that's actually what's happening. So uh, it's quite, quite nice. Uh, and regarding the CBDC, the central bank um, digital currencies, the Brazilian Central Bank, yes, yeah, said uh, we now have a, a president of the Central Bank that is very, uh, he, he's a former like Chicago guy, I would say, uh, Chicago School of Economics. Uh, he is uh, very into the, to the, to this idea of digitalizing the, the currency. However, um, for me, it's a philosophical question in Brazil. Uh, if Brazil has a central bank digital currency, Will it come with the same restrictions, the capital controls that the normal currency has, or it will be an upgrade on that? Uh, if not, the CBDC is just a crypto version of a, an already failed Brazilian real that has no use in international scenario. If the CBDC is done in the right way and it becomes an internationally traded currency, then we might see some interesting challenge and then BRZ, it's kind of like a can be uh, endangered by this project. But I don't think the central bank will change its doctrine. Uh, it will keep the capital controls. It will keep the way it is. Uh, and then the CBDC will just be a, a trend that the Brazilian central bank has to say they are doing. Otherwise, they will not be following the trend. So that's my opinion on it. Thank you. Um, and uh, on our end, so, uh, Mainly the Bilira users are retail users. In Turkey, uh, the crypto space and the crypto adaptation is very high. And we allow the Turkish users to reach the DeFi projects and the global exchanges in Turkish Lira terms because the Turkish users uh, always think in Turkish Lira terms uh, on that end. We And we are going to start going uh, B2B soon as well. Uh, but in Turkey, there's no uh, capital control, so the companies can uh, go through the banking system as well. But the use cases are use cases are going to be coming. And as for the CBDCs, uh, the Turkish Central Bank has been working in detail with them, and we have been meeting uh, with them and explaining our project and how I see it that uh, the central bank digital currencies are going to be on hybrid uh, blockchains. They're not going to be on only on the public blockchain. It's going to be a messaging system between the central bank and the retail banks. And I believe that in the future, the CBDCs and the public chain stable coins are going to coexist and work together. And the users are going to prefer the public chain uh, stable coins, and they're going to be interchangeable uh, with the CBDC issued by the central bank. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, thank you for the question, Lori. Uh, and uh, I'll take uh, the last question here. Um, and that's just in terms of competition. Um, you know, who do you guys see as competition, um, you know, internally beyond you know, the countries, you know, your main countries and, you know, uh, uh, what just what other stable coins uh, do you think are doing good jobs? Your turn, Sina. <laughs> okay. Your turn, Sina. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, 
In Turkey, there's uh, e-money licensed companies uh, like Venmo type of apps. And on our end right now, we have only been non-custodial. And as the regulation comes, we're planning to create a custodial version as well. And how we see it, we have two different plays. One of them is being on the infrastructure play, uh, where we uh, actually believe that in the next five years, the financial ecosystem is going to be moving to the blockchain space. And we want to represent the Turkish lira there. And on the second uh, side, uh, once the regulation comes, we're going to create a custodial version uh, through an app where the user is going to interact with it like it's a mobile banking app or a mobile e-money app and don't even know they're interacting with the blockchain. So, and as for competitors, we're the only one in Turkey so far. And we don't uh, believe in the short term there's going to be competitors. But as the regulation comes together, uh, there might be different players trying to do uh, Turkish Lira stable coins, or they would build uh, use cases uh, using the Bilira token on top of our, on top of us. Okay. Thanks. Uh, as for our case, Lou, I would say that we have uh, there are two more projects at least in Brazil that are also doing a Brazilian stable coin. However, they are, uh, their volumes are, are way, way smaller, I would say, uh, by like a tenth smaller. And I think we are, when we are talking about stable coins, we are tending to uh, like a natural monopoly on each currency. Uh, I don't see a reason for five Brazilian stable coins or a reason for five uh, lira, uh, Turkish lira stable coins. Um, I would say the only currency that might have one more, more than one stable coin is the US dollar due to some specific uh, usage. Uh, for example, if you look like institutionally, the USDC is way ahead of Tether. However, Tether has a much higher volume and liquidity. So I think there is space for like two or three US dollar stable coins, but that's definitely not the case for emerging country stable coins. Um, and also the name of the game, especially for a Brazilian stable coin is international liquidity. And the way we did it with BRZ was we first integrated to international exchanges and we actually made it into an internationally traded asset before going to the Brazilian exchanges and creating on ramps in Brazil, that would be the easiest part. So basically international liquidity is the name of the game. And right now BRZ is the only one that actually has international liquidity. Uh, the other stable coins in Brazil, they kind of circulate internally. And that is not a pain in the Brazilian payment system. We have a very efficient banking system when we talk about local payments in Brazil. We have instant bank transfers uh, five days a week for at least 10 years now. Brazil is one of the first countries in the world to have that. However, we have a, a, a very bad international banking system. And that's where we are aiming to, to tackle the, this problem. Makes a lot of sense. Thanks. And we, we end uh, every stable coins are killing it with the same question. And that's uh, if you guys are on the show in a year, uh, what do you think uh, we'll be talking about uh, that we didn't talk about today? Mm, I, I would say one of the things that uh, Laurie actually mentioned before will become a large topic in the next year will be uh, the geopolitical implications of central bank uh, digital currencies and how countries will start uh, circumventing embargoes and blacklists using uh, two CBDC pairs between them. For example, Russia and China, Russia and Brazil, uh, Iran and some other country. That would be hot, I would say. Uh, and I think that's the reason for CBDCs to exist. Uh, and just, of course, just, we'll... Just, yep. just, just go back to that. And, and, the, you know, and, and that's because... Right now, if they use SWIFT, then... Exactly. So we, right now, we, we have this, uh, what we, we had the gold standard before. Now we have the dollar standard, right? You need to go through the dollar for everything. So that makes it impossible, for example, for Brazil to bilaterally trade with uh, Russia on certain embargo goods, uh, goods that are suffering embargo. And with two CBDCs in the direct settlement, they're, they're, right? You know, suffering an embargo from... Uh, Russia. Okay. Yeah Russia, yeah, Russia, for example, they had this embargo, the EU did uh, some embargo on some products from Russia after they invaded Ukraine, right? So uh, I would say CBDCs could be a way to circumvent uh, embargoes and restrictions.
for example, if you want to buy oil from Venezuela nowadays, it's not that easy, but with the CBDC between two countries, uh, they will do trade. So that might be a very interesting challenge to the dollar standard. And I think that will be a hot topic next year. And regarding our own projects, I wish that in one year from now, we are talking on how the Brazilian stable coin is actually becoming larger than the underlying currency, the Brazilian real. So that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> We're working on that. Okay, thanks. Um, and uh, what I think that's going to be happening in the next year is that the coins like Libra, which is backed by multiple different fiat and reach to uh, billions of people through these companies is going to be important because in countries like Turkey and Brazil, uh, the purchasing power uh, parity of the individuals has lost a lot of value uh, due to government's uh, different uh, decisions or because of emerging countries and COVID and such. But I believe that uh, every uh, individual in the world is going to be looking for uh, solutions that's not tied up to only one uh, country and tied up to more uh, where the governments are, where the world is going to. And Bitcoin uh, tried to be uh, like this initially, but I believe Bitcoin is a store of value uh, now rather than a medium of exchange and I'm excited to see uh, either Libra or different stable coins that back uh, different type of uh, both uh, develop, developed and emerging country stable coins together. Right. Have you heard of uh, like Saga? Again, they might have recently changed their name. Uh, yeah, the thing. Israelis, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> They're doing that in SDR, which is the IMF basket of, I think, uh, six or seven currencies, I forget, but it's a, a super interesting project. Well, great. It well, uh, that, that's it for uh, Stable Coins Are Killing It, uh, episode number 17. Uh, we've got a great show next week again with uh, featuring uh, Terra, um, which is a stable coin that's uh, uh, scaling uh, uh, actually you know, quite rapidly uh, and lots of users in South Korea. Uh, so that's uh, a, a, another really interesting uh, uh, project. So, uh, and with that, I'd just like to thank, um, you know, thank both you guys, uh, Sinan, Tiago, uh, you were great. Thanks a lot for attending and see everybody next week. Thank you very much, Lou. Thank, thank you, Sinan. Thank you for everyone Good. who watched. <laughs> thank you.